afternoon, everyone. Good We're afternoon. just letting everyone in. So glad everyone's joined us today. Oh. Uh, we are going to start by muting everyone. Hi, Tammy. We're going to start by muting everyone, and then as um, we move forward and we start to engage in our conversations, we'll start to unmute and ask you to uh, use the chat as well. Just a second. While we're waiting and admitting everyone, if you could put in the chat box your name and where, what state you're in, we'd love to see who's here today. If you're not speaking, we are going to ask that you go ahead and mute your computer and or your phone. Just a minute more and we'll get started. Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome again, everyone, to the Build Initiatives webinar series, Home-Based Child Care, Rising to the Challenge and Lasting Infrastructure Needed to Support Providers. My name is Danielle Fuentes Johnson. I'm a Learning Communities Technical Specialist with the Build Initiative. And I am joined today in facilitating this call with my colleague and partner in this endeavor, Gina Capito, also from the BUILD Initiative. And later we'll hear from Rosemary Montero Hernandez. Today's session, next slide. Today's session is supporting home-based childcare through systemic infrastructure. We're looking forward to that discussion. And next week, the next on our schedule is on June 23rd, and that's delivering relationship-based supports. And we're looking forward to a, another lively discussion then as well. We do want to invite everyone to participate. We want to, we want to co-create these sessions with you, hear from you, hear what's happening in your systems and your states and communities. And so we ask you to please make use of the chat box, unmute yourself, and we'd love to hear from a number of voices. We will be pausing occasionally and using the format that was introduced on our very first discussion call a few weeks ago, in which we will ask everyone to um, respond and then just let us know that your, your thoughts complete by saying complete thank you, I'm finished, let us know so the next person can, can join. Because we do have a number of people on the call today and we wanna hear from as many voices as possible. Next slide, please. And with that, I will introduce Gina Capito. Hi everyone, great to see you all again. As Danielle said, we are gonna dig into this discussion to more build on this idea of infrastructure to support family child care settings. And so we really want to unpack more this idea of what is meant by a lasting infrastructure, what the components of that work are, and what it means to be durable or longstanding. And so in part, I want to start off by saying that part of this concept is thinking about how at a system level or via a systemic solution, we support family child care providers as opposed to instances, and I think we've all been in these situations where we find ourselves with kind of an immediate 
need or problem and we come up with a kind of one-off solution to that need or problem. And I think what we found, and I know from working with many of you over the years in your states and communities on your support structures for family child care, that there's sort of a cobbling together of those concepts of one-offs or putting things together. But the what we all sort of fundamentally know is how important it is for family child care that we really stop and think about what are the needs of the family child care community and how do we build a long-standing or you can use the term durable, something that really lasts and is part of the fabric of your early care and education community. How do we build that that is for family child care supports and what does that look like? So we are really excited to have Rosemary joining us today because we are going to, after I give you a little bit of a sort of 101 on some of these elements of and the idea of a lasting infrastructure, we're gonna really get into more of the details of practical implementation with the Massachusetts experience implementing systems and the benefits to providers and communities and all the elements that go into that idea within a community. And so that's where we're really gonna be able to even um, together get more into thinking about how some of these things have played out for you in your states and communities and areas where you've had some successes with it that you can share out as well as we hear from Rosemary and um, think more about the specific details of it. So with that, I wanna start us thinking about this idea of a network. So one of, this is one of the approaches, and frankly, networks are often seen and referred to as one of the most kind of broad and all-encompassing approaches to support family child care or to support really even any child care providers. More and more states that I work with are referencing a network style approach for their small um, child care centers as well, because just really thinking about capacity and quality of services delivered, the approach is very tailorable and very uh, much responsive to the need of the providers that it's designed for. And that's sort of at the most basic level, that's what it is. A network is an approach to increase the quality and the capacity of child care providers. And again, I know from working with many of you over recent years regarding family child care, that these are things that you've explored. You either have a system, in the case of Massachusetts, or our featured speaker today, or you have a statewide approach to some element of supports for family child care, like in California, and then some of your regional areas, like in the Bay Area, you've really dug in and built in more of the quality measures and the quality supports through that approach that maybe isn't part of the statewide approach, but you really tailored it for the local community. And that really speaks to this idea of how a network is that sort of approach and that this approach can be tailored and built for those communities and responsive to the need of those communities. And one of the reasons why we know that this is such a fundamental need or support opportunity and way to approach family child care is some of the data that Lanet shared with us from the National Association for Family Child Care last week. During um, Lanet's presentation and sharing of some of the surveying that they've done, they found that in the COVID space right now that we're all encountering, you'll recall that providers that are linked in or part of a association, a network they felt that could identify with some sort of support structure reported that they were faring better. And so we know that certainly pandemic aside, that would be true in day-to-day -day tasks too. And we hear that from providers that when they have a place to go to for the supports around the accessing the subsidy, how they administer payments, all of those elements of running their day-to-day -day program, as well as delivering on quality early learning experiences for families, they're better supported when they're part of a structure that's thinking about, and in the case of family child care, it's thinking about the unique nature of family child care to do that. And that's what we're going to really unpack more of today while we talk to Rosemary about it. And so to share also on this screen is this idea that you can find the approach at its most fundamental level of this concept of a network in lots of different ways. You can see it play out in a staff family child care network. You can see associations filling this role in regions and areas of um, states and communities. You see community hubs. This concept has cropped up both in Head Start and Early Head Start grants as well as just at the community organizing level. Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships, both grants before the new partnerships funding that started in 2014 and then those that have been implemented since that funding have thought about this idea of how do you build a network 
that organizes a group of family child cares together and works on responding to their needs in that um, coordinated collaborative way. We also find that in shared service alliance, they often are built into or part of networks and they also may be the hub for the network or the source for the network too. So you can kind of start to think about the places that if you're not currently part of this in your own community or running these in your community, you may be aware of some of these and start to think about this kind of broad net that is this concept of a network and what this approach may look like. As we continue to explore the idea of a network, one of the things that we want to then really think about is this idea of responsiveness and how a network allows by a strategy, it really allows for being responsive to and building the network components that are responsive to the providers that that network is going to serve. And so that means that you could have a set of kind of parameter for how you approach a network as a state or a region, but then how it gets implemented may vary in the different communities that it's implemented in based on the needs of those providers. And so some of that is really supports us to think about what, what shape do these different type of variances take across networks. And they really fall into a couple major areas. So the types of services that a network is engaged in delivering may vary, and that's going to be, hopefully, we have our fingers crossed always, that it's going to vary based on response to provider need and under real understanding of provider need. It may also vary in the depth and intensity of services, and I'll give an example here in a second, which then naturally ties very much to the numbers of providers that are served or the caseload of the individuals that are working in the network. And this is where we start to get into some of um, starting to put a stake in this concept of uh, certain components of a network. And one of those components and one of the things that um, BUILD has done a lot of work with the Federal Office of Child Care and the Quality Center around is this idea of a staffed family child care network. And that while we know there's a lot of value to uh, more informal peer groups that are sort of peer-to-peer -peer networking, the concept of a staff family child care network where there's dedicated staff that are receiving training and ongoing support for how they engage with family child care providers uniquely positions them to have a shared set of values and guiding principles for how they work with family child care and what they're trying to achieve with those family child care providers and a set of services that they're delivering on. And that's where you end up with very similar to the way we serve families you have family child care specialists as part of a staff network who have a caseload of family child care providers that they work with. And in that space, we know that the more intense the supports are and kind of the deeper that you're going and business supports, quality supports, really capacity building work, smaller caseload and more intense kind of relationship-based services are more likely to generate that type of change and support for the provider. The same thing that we know when working with families. Lower caseloads of families that we're serving means that we have deeper and better relationships with those families. It's a, certainly a parallel process in this instance. And so I promised as sort of part of thinking about the variances of networks that we'd also look at some of the services that may be inherent to a network. And so I want to share a list of the deliverables that we know family child care networks, staff family child care networks across the country are delivering. And so you can kind of take a second to look at the different types of services that make up the work of staff family child care networks. And what you see in here is you can kind of start to think about this idea of differences in intensity or volume of activities that a network. And this is one of those examples of how a network can really ensure that it is being responsive to the areas of greatest need for a provider. And that's one of those things that we know is a critical foundation of staff family child care networks is to really understand and be responding to the need of the providers that they're um, engaging with because it's relationship-based work. So it's really critical that it is very much built by the providers and for the providers with them. And then the other thing that you'll see is a variance at times is leveraging what exists in the state. So for instance, depending on how a state approaches the administration of the child and adult care food program, there are some states or communities that find that that needs to be a critical feature of a staff family child care network because in order for the family child care providers to really leverage that resource and that, that source of funding for the food that they're purchasing for children, they need that support for the administration. And other communities that we work in, in other states, and I'm sure you can relate some of this as well, is they find that there may already be an infrastructure that supports providers in the administration of the CACFP program. And so in that instance, you would see a difference in how the network looked across, say, those two states because of what already existed as part of the state infrastructure or the state support structure. 
same thing if we then think about like coaching or the consultation and that sort of can vary in intensity. And this again goes to caseload, right? If you have a smaller caseload and you're working with family child care providers, you can do much more intensive consultation and coaching with those that you're serving, where if you have a caseload of say 100 providers that you're trying to engage in a relationship with, your coaching may be more of quick phone calls, email, touch base, sending resources, and not as much of the intense relationship-based approach. And I'm not going to spend too much more time on that because I know that Rosemary is going to be able to give us a little bit more color on what that actually looks like in practice across regions and across the, the approach. So I want to start from this perspective just to get us thinking about this concept and acknowledging that if we think about how critical this type of an approach and support structure can be to family child care, that we also need to be then thinking about what is the infrastructure that exists in a state or region in order to support this approach to family child care providers and ensure that it's thriving and that it's able, that it's well-funded and it's getting its needs met. And I think all of you are finding as you're engaged in response to COVID right now and the uh, it more, even more apparent role of family child care and meeting the needs of families of very young children in our communities and states is, you know, it's risen up even more so to the top with the crisis. It demonstrates even more how important it is that we're really thoughtful about how we build a lasting infrastructure to support the types of needs that family child care um, are most responsive to and, and will meet their needs in the best way possible. So we're really thinking about this at both levels, and not just the individual network, but what is the infrastructure that exists in the state or region in order to make that, that network approach thrive, and what does that look like? And that's one of the reasons why Rosemary was such a great speaker for us today, because she's got that experience of directly running a family child care network herself, but then also working at the regional level and at the state level and thinking about that infrastructure of supports as a whole. And so before we turn to start to dig in more on the Massachusetts approach, what I wanted to just share is a little bit of the research that over the, the years and many years, you can see by looking at some of the dates that are cited here all the way back to easily back to 2009, that there has been work on what are the types of supports and resources that are most likely to move change for family child care providers. And I want to highlight a couple of the things here. We're going to continue to unpack these concepts with next week's conversation, we're actually going to have uh, all of the researchers uh, that are cited here are going to be joining us at one point or another next week in our discussion to kind of think more about some of how they're working on understanding networks and the impact that they have. But I just want to highlight that what research on networks has found is that sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction between the dedicated staff of a network and the providers that are engaged in the network is the kind of has the best potential for improving the quality and reducing the isolation that we know family child care providers can feel because they are is a solo activity. The other thing to highlight is that the frequent visits by network staff that are really focused on the caregiver child interactions and promoting positive child development are much more likely to result in improving and moving higher um, provider quality. So if we're thinking about quality and capacity as well as business support, we want to really make sure that we're thinking about, well, what are the strategies or engagement with providers that are most likely to move them on that sort of quality and capacity? And I think we can all relate that, that when we are engaged in a real one-on-one -on -one interaction where we feel kind of held by the individual that we're in our relationship with, we're much more likely for that to be a more meaningful engagement for us and to have more impact on our own behavior, our own well-being. And so some of those same principles are, are holding true in what we know about networks. So I just wanted to share that to reinforce this idea of um, how important it is that we're really thoughtful about the impact of the approach as we then think about the infrastructure that's needed to support maintaining an approach like this in the state or region. I'm going to pause for a second because we'd still promise you a much an interactive session. And I know that I have not been as interactive in, in this instance as I'm kind of giving you a little bit of a download on download on staffed family child care networks and this um, core concept. And then move it on to introduce Rosemary more formally. And we're going to engage in kind of a Q&A with Rosemary. And we're going to, uh, we have several questions, things that have come up over the course of um, the, the first couple sessions of discussions on family child care, and then also some kind of core questions that we know are about this idea of how do we build lasting infrastructure. So we've kind of structured it in that way. And then as Danielle said, within that, we have lots of places for stopping and having more um, interaction and discussion with you as a, a group of leaders in this space. So 
As I mentioned, Rosemary is a regional director for a family child care network in Massachusetts. One thing not to be confusing, Massachusetts refers to their family child care networks as family child care systems. <laughs> so you're going to hear Rosemary repeatedly use the term system, and, and she's referring to that discrete um, network concept. Um, and then there's also the system that those systems are part of, right, Rosemary? You probably spend a lot of time going in and out of using those terms in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> So we just wanted to put that out there that those in this instance these terms are going to be interchangeable and to give you a little bit of background on those networks um, or systems there's approximately 40 of them in the state they are designed to cover the whole state so that the all providers all family child cares would have the ability to engage in a family child care system and there's about 5,000 family child care programs that are currently participating in a system Rosemary is going to talk more about this idea of how they're part of an overall association and the advocacy and connections that happen because of that, that regional nature of them as well. So just to highlight that that is a part of what the systems um, support for family child care providers as well. And then to give you a sense of some of the services that the Massachusetts network slash systems work with on for family child care educators. Um, and we're going to unpack more of these with some of our questions, that idea of access to subsidized child care reimbursements, supporting the parent relationship in accessing the subsidized slots, so the enrollment of families is such a critical piece as we know, for, of course, professional development opportunities, best practices for quality, so some of the same core features that we've spoke about as this idea of the broad components of a staff family child care network or this type of infrastructure support. This is part of what we find in the Massachusetts system. So with that, I want to officially welcome Rosemary. Say hello and see if Rosemary has anything to add on this kind of quick, quick snippet on the system approach. Hi, um, thank you everybody um, for being on this call and for having this conversation and thank you to the Build Network and all the staff. Um, I'm happy to be here to answer questions and kind of review the systems approach that we have in Massachusetts which um, Gina had mentioned that we call systems uh, is our family child care networks. And we also are part of, um, many systems are part of also a network, we have it kind of backwards, that's for advocacy. I think that you touched upon a great deal of a lot of the things that the Massachusetts systems do. Um, the one piece that I would add on to is the advocacy as well of family child care, where um, a lot of the uh, systems also think about having great partnerships with the state entity, having good relationships and in, in, um, knowing and disseminating information to family childcare. I think it's, it's really important to highlight the connection that there is with our family childcare educators um, and highlighting the coaching and mentoring and the one-on-one -on -one that happens. And I have to agree with Gina that one of the things and the research that she mentioned, that one of the things that highlights our systems is that a relationship with our um, staff, with our system staff. So just to add on to what she was saying, and I know that we have some great questions that are gonna unpack a lot more of what we do in Massachusetts. Thanks. All right, let's jump in. So the first area that we're gonna talk about is this idea of how the infrastructure of your family child care system support family child care providers in access. And so the first question in that area, sorry, let me get my screen to advance for us all is to really think about what type of access do providers gain through their participation in the system. So if you want to expand on some of the areas of that the providers wouldn't have without participating in a system, the access they have. So one of the things that our um, systems uh, do is work closely with the, with the parents and the relationship of the provider and the parent. Um, we manage the subsidized uh, slots that are available. So we do the billing, the documentation, the kind of building that relationship, um, the admissions process of having parents. We also, um, many of the systems also partner with other agencies to provide, either they have their own transportation or they um, subsidize with other agencies to provide the transportation. So in, in the support of access, uh, the provider has the full support of a system that can engage her in um, having the proper documentation, having the relationship. doesn't have to um, 
or have to do with the collection of parent fees, any documentation that have to be kept annually. Um, the, the system uh, works uh, directly with the parents to kind of keep up with all of those things. So in terms of access, we support full access. And I think it's really important to highlight that also many systems, not all, but many systems encourage providers because our sole mission is to support and promote the um, family child care home, the educator. So we encourage uh, providers to actually have also private slots if they if they have children that are not necessarily on a subsidized uh, slot but they have incurred a parent that has private we support that um, availability for the educator because our main goal is to have that educator full of course as a system and I, I don't think we touched upon that um, one of the the structures that is placed on the system is that if we do have subsidized slots, there is an admin fee that is given to the family child care system. So that that encourages us absolutely to work more with the, with the access of subsidized, but we encourage also um, providers to be full, whether that means it's a subsidized slot or it's a private slot. And that speaks directly to the family child care home. I'm going to hop us to the next question because I think that that starts to get at part of what you just shared there and then we'll see if there's some any other questions or thoughts in the chat before we uh, move to some discussion but this idea of the state role that provide that the um, state makes in order to make these benefits available to providers you made kind of an important statement there around the support for subsidized um, helping them uh, maintain private slots as well but that a, the network as an infrastructure that providers are part of does receive some an admin fee is that, is that the term that you use for it for that supporting the administration of the subsidy right so if we start to think about like how do you make some of these infrastructure supports durable Mm -hmm. that's an element right the network gets compensation as well for supporting families and accessing subsidy and supporting proprietors and being able to take subsidy right correct so the the actual structure of the family child care system we have what's called home visitors some locations there are variations of names of that there's education coordinators which is pretty much the similar role that there are staff dedicated staff that go into the homes but then we also have behind the scenes we have some agencies, not all, but particularly mine has professional development, a professional, a dedicated role that thinks about professional development and how to um, have and encourage and participate all of our educators to participate in that. We also have a billing team that um, is behind the scenes working to make sure that the, the, the billing process is run smoothly um, so that that way we can support the cater in their um, payment and their payment structure. And um, in my role in particular to oversee each one of the sites because we have multiple sites throughout the state. So providing that um, that connection to the educator, knowing that she has a full support that they were able to provide her with that one on one and also kind of going through um, the uh, regulations or some of the things that to kind of uh, be able to help the educator kind of run through some of the things that are happening in terms of the state um, and what the state issues. So um, I see the question that comes in and yes, family child care educators are licensed. Um, they have to have a license and we help them through the process of having a license and renewing their license as well. Um, we also promote, which I, we're going to probably get to that a little later, but we also promote high quality programs. So in our structure, we work with our educators within our professional development system, within the tools that we offer them, we support them to have a high quality program. But the structure is really important to kind of establish um, that relationship with the educator and having that process through. I'm glad that you took us there, Rosemary, because that was one of the questions I wanted to tee up to you from the chat was this idea, idea of how the structure supports FCCs, but also if you wanted to speak a little bit to one of the questions was how do we increase involvement from FCC providers in a structure like this? And so can you reflect a little bit on how the structure um, has been built or how you use it to try and encourage you know, that outreach and engagement of providers in the system? 
Right. So uh, family child care systems itself have been around in Massachusetts since 1970. And it came from that idea that the educator needed more support and kind of be able to uh, navigate the regulations and rules that are available. So um, naturally coming with the role when an educator I get phone calls of educators. I want to be a family child care educator. What do I do? Where do I, who do I connect with? So in many instances, we're kind of growing that educator right from the beginning. Um, also, we are also a CCAFP um, uh, entity. So we have kind of like a dual role, even though we run it separately, it's under one, one agency, but it's two umbrellas. We support the a food program and a lot of times through access of the food program they hear about our services our additional services that we can offer um, in the community family child care educators know our name through through the work that we do with them because we offer a lot of support and they're like hmm, I have another educator or I have someone else I can support and in many instances even the family child care licensors recommend to the the educators you know, there's a really good system. It seems like you're struggling with this. They can give you additional support. They can help you more with that. Okay. Let's continue with a few. Oh. I was just going to say, we can continue with a few of the yeah. ones that are in the chat. I think the first thing, just to yeah. clear up uh, that we didn't do at the outset, that we should have um, done that clarity of kind of language choice. Um, Danielle and I, you will find us move um, in and out of home-based childcare and family childcare and use those two terms very interchangeably. W working across states and communities, we definitely find instances, and, and thank you to, for Rosemary um, kind of clarifying Massachusetts, that in some states, the, either the structure or the term is very specifically used to refer to licensed or FFN, refers to um, providers, uh, family, friend, and neighbor care providers who are not licensed or not even uh, even required to be licensed. You know, kind of acknowledging there's a lot of variances across that, uh, across all of your states in this area. We want to first say that we do use the term home-based childcare and family childcare interchangeably across the, the all of these discussions. And so we want you to feel you know, comfortable moving in and out of those. And we do um, acknowledge, and there are a lot of instances where, and, and Rosemary uh, um, started on this track too, of that your first point of contact may be with a family, friend, and neighbor care setting, and it's about then supporting them to become a licensed care provider. There are instances, of course, where there are some programs that are available for one type of provider or another, but we are trying to, um, at, through the process of discussing the supports that home-based care needs, think about ways in which you can think across all the different types of providers without you know, forcing it one way or another. To you. We're, not, we're not defining that for you, but we're sort of trying to allow for the range of supports and what those supports look like and how different they are for different providers at different points and allow you to really think about kind of tailoring it for your individual community or state as you think about implementing the work. Mm -hmm. And so, but obviously in the Massachusetts instance, the um, FCCs that are part of the systems are licensed. That's something that the, our Massachusetts colleagues have, have made clear in their answer. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that came into the chat, and I think it'd be great for us to touch base a little bit because it certainly starts to speak to some of the intersection between systems and state infrastructures and resources that are available through the state thinking about quality is, for example, for example, your quality rating and improvement structures within many of your states and the fact that there are many um, support structures within states like quality specialists that work directly with providers, both centers and family child care homes to um, get their initial rating on the quality improvement, move up, continually improve quality. And I just want to give one little snippet on that in general, as we think about this, particularly at this point, as we're trying to really think about how do we leverage and build a strong system to support family child care that is responsive to kind of where we are and how do we do things better going forward and kind of build on what we know. We want to leverage those things. We don't want to build a family child care network or system in any state or community that duplicates what the QRIS quality specialists are paid to do. You know, and as we've worked with several of your states around this idea of thinking about kind of what do we have and where might the gaps be in how we support family child care, this is one of those great opportunities to say, what do we have available through the quality rating and improvement system that supports the movement of 
building of quality, capacity building, how do we leverage that? How do we use a network to maybe support providers in feeling more comfortable in engaging in the state QRIS, to getting that first rating, to think to understanding even the system is, is one of the many examples of how it's a partnership between a network and QRIS, and then there's some places where QRIS staff are actually embedded at the network. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to go about that, but to, to Cammie's question around kind of where does QRIS fit into this, and, and I want to have Rosemary speak to that as well, it, I think it's really important to be very intentional about it. That's what we continue to find, because we don't want to double up or duplicate resources. We want to leverage what we've built as structures. So, Rosemary, do you want to reflect a little bit on how QRIS is integrated into system work? Absolutely. So QRIS is, um, Massachusetts is known for collaboration. So what, what one place does, family child care systems, um, we will always communicate and collaborate with others. I think that distinguishing factor is you have program quality specialists that, you, that offer technical assistance on the database for um, enrolling in quality rating improvement system, what their applications may look like, they come and do the observation to kind of move up to the rating scale. But the difference for the family child care system is we are doing the day to day pieces. Like, for example, if a family child care educator says, I'm ready to apply, um, but I'm really not quite sure if my environment is quite ready. I rated myself this. Can you do a second rating to kind of look at what I what I'm seeing? So we support um, the initiative that is already established in Massachusetts. And also there's another arm of professional development grantees that also provide professional development in um, the relationship of a high quality program. But we all collaborate, even though there are different arms and have different opportunities to kind of touch upon. One of the things that distinguishes family child care systems, we're like that one-on-one -on -one person. If that educator has a question in a different language, can't quite understand, or um, has doesn't really know how to move forward, we take them at whatever level they're at and kind of help them move up the ladder, per se, and we're that individual help that's the front line that's touching their homes, basically. So, but we do collaborate very well with the state entity and the, the um, resources that they have available. For example, another uh, piece is if there's any grants that are available um, and educators need assistance in kind of applying for the grants or not, not, they're not quite comfortable in what that grant might look like or the business side of the language of what they have to kind of put together, we help them with that as well. So there's, there's many pieces that we kind of offer that individual technical assistance to support them. And it, in Massachusetts, it's a benefit to kind of rise through that quality rating improvement system because once you go from level one to level two, you get a slight increase in your reimbursement for slots. So there's the incentive there to kind of, and there's also access to other grants and other things that kind of support the educator to want to move up that scale. Rosemary, do you want to do a quick and answer that question about whether or not the home educators pay for the network services? They don't. It, the way that we structure is um, the, we, we only, there's a, a per day uh, fee for, for subsidized slots and most of that fee goes to the educator and there's a small portion that's a ad, is considered an admin fee that goes to the family child care system. But again, we don't limit our family child care educators to just have uh, subsidized slots. Uh, we also allow and, and give them the opportunity. Actually, it's really good for the educator to be full. So I have, for example, in, in my organization, educators that don't have any subsidized slots, we still offer them the same services as if they had all of their children subsidized. Um, we offer the services to them. They don't have to pay anything. <laughs> trying to see in the little letters the questions that are coming in. <laughs> so if you want to narrate them to me, I can't see them. <laughs> well, well, Danielle's actually going to take. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I was also going to just put out there again that we would love to see your face if you are comfortable and hear your voice. The chat box is also an option, so please feel free to participate in that way as well. Let's see. Yeah, to that um, point, I'm going to stop sharing for a sec so everybody can see each other. Mm -hmm. And maybe if folks want to ask their questions 
out, out loud or share some of your experience as well. One of the things we did want to reflect on was a little bit more about that FFN role and the variances across the country and how FFNs are organized. So FFN, I'm not familiar. What's the whole term? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, Rosemary. Danielle was going to answer that one regarding um, family, friend, and neighbor care because there is some variances across different states and how um, within some networks they do. Sorry about that, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I was willing to to kind of in in Massachusetts they all have to have a license. So and they do there through the CCR and ours there are subsidized um, slots that are for family um, and and that are issued for families. So there is some section of that, but that in particular they run through the CCR and ours directly. Yep. And we do know from work with some of the states that there are some examples of programs that that do engage with family, friend, and neighbor providers and specifically help them build capacity to open license centers and depending on the state regulations. And we act, we are going to hear from some of those, um, those systems and networks mm -hmm. in the coming week, different sessions. And later we'll, we will have an announcement of, of um, relaunching our webinar, our website platform of resources. And some of those resources will speak to that as well. One thing that I did want to emphasize um, when the other questions come in, I can stop, but I think that um, in terms of culture, language, and the handholding that is needed a lot of times for having a support, that's one distinguishing factor that the family child care systems have, that you're, we're able to provide additional supports that may not necessarily be in other um, in other types of um, resources that are out there. So I think it's really important to distinguish that. And we partner a lot with community agencies, for example, um, in my community in, in the Western Mass part of, of Massachusetts, there are other entities that benefit from having um, women, um, minorities, and having opening a business. So we partner with them kind of saying, well, this is an opportunity to have family child, uh, a business open. And we kind of, we kind of um, relate to them. We also work with other organizations like um, DTA or others that then naturally need childcare, that actually need to have the service of, of childcare. And that's how we do kind of marketing. Um, have you thought about, you know, what are the opportunities that are available? So we do try to touch bases with other organizations that are like-minded so that we can support our educators in access and supporting them in their, um, their actual um, journey of being an early childhood educator. For example, I know that currently with the COVID situation that we're going through, we're helping educators, and this is something that's that's a relationship that has expanded. For example, with um, PPP loans, you know, like providing technical assistance or um, the PUA, and kind of talk to them. We're always thinking avant-garde to kind of look at forward of what are the resources that our educators need so that they can continue doing their business. So I think that's really important to kind of distinguish that that not only it's it's an inward relationship, it's also an outward relationship where we're constantly looking for ways to support the educator and the families as well. Along those lines, one of the other questions that came in, Rosemary, um, from Amy Freelander was around whether or not you provide an automated system for the payments and processing for your childcare providers. Do you wanna to speak to that? So um, we process on a monthly basis. I mean, every and every family child care system has a little variation of that. But from month to month, we process attendance and billing forms, and we are on a payment schedule. And for our particular agency, not every agency does the same thing, but they can choose to be paid either reimbursed monthly or they could be reimbursed um, every other week. And we handle that um, circulation of funds. We're a pass-through agency, so the fund comes directly from the state to us. We allocate it out to to all the, to the field. And with that, is there any childcare management software that you make available for the family childcare educators? So um, there, we have worked on. So internally, we have um, software that is utilized, and with the um, food program, there is software that we use, like Kid Care and other programs as well. 
but um and the attendance can be handed in you know via email or we even do pictures <laughs> but um to enter it directly into the database we do that for them so whatever is needed to do for the state we actually do that for them all they have to do is keep a manual one for um in case the state agency comes and they have to provide the documentation we need something in writing from them but we do the electronic piece of it yeah i moved us to because that question kind of supported this idea of thinking about payment systems rosemary has already spoken so much about the access how it supports supply of family child care by the access to the subsidy rates and the support for them to be full across both subsidized slots and private pay and so i wanted to see if there um, if you wanted to share a little bit about how supply of family child care is supported in the areas of marketing and messaging by having the systems I think overall we could do much better, but we do support um, educators in terms of right from the beginning. Um, if you have an educator that wants to come into the field, I know that there are some systems that actually hold classes. They go into partnership with um, ABE programs or other programs to kind of um, leverage their skills and knowledge. Um, we also provide um, lots of professional development opportunities to raise the skills. So whether it's a beginner um, person that's trying to get into family child care um, to be an educator, or it's someone that's seasoned, we take them from where they're at and kind of help them grow with the opportunities and resources that are available. In terms of marketing, we help the educator do their marketing we help them do their marketing but we also do marketing for them i mentioned a little earlier we partner with other agencies we do flyers business cards and relationships we build relationships with the community so that people know that we are available um and in terms of um messaging about family child care that that to me speaks directly to the advocacy piece. We do a lot of advocacy for family child care and with family child care to um, talk about the needs as a family child care home because they're individual. For example, um, in the homes, having the, the mixed delivery system of being so strong on having multi-ages. In Massachusetts, they could have any a child anywhere from um, infant right to 13 years old so that's we message you know the benefits of having the family child care home not just the um, resources of having a great curriculum and a high quality program but also the benefit that, that it is to being in a home so we do a lot of um, collaborating with educators to kind of elevate that message and be part of also um, advocacy opportunities that are available. And we, we have a very good relationship with the state agencies as well. We communicate, we participate in a lot of the things that are happening throughout the state. Mm -hmm. There's an official network too. I mean, and that's how you and I met the BUILD initiative that um, MADCA, which is the Massachusetts Association for Daycare Agencies, that not only looks at family child care, but also center-based programs, but it's all about the early childhood field and how to advocate. But we have our own group for family child care where we come together as systems and talk about how do we support and elevate the field and how to share best practices. And so we kind of we, we try to um, stay avant-garde to all of the pieces, not at only the educator, but also as a system, how to elevate our system and work together, and also building re good relationships with the state. Right, right. Yeah, let's hang on to that the relationship with the state one because i think that's something we for us to uh, we've got a couple questions for you a little later on that but i think that's such an important point that idea of the regional organizing and the communicating with the state and how that supports the state to maintain the type of durable infrastructure that the, the systems need to thrive right that, that, so that the state is kind of committed to and investing in that uh, want to take a quick minute to do a poll so that we can hear a little bit from folks uh, on the line about some of the areas that they see as the um, biggest areas of need in particular in this area of supporting supply so danielle okay i'll say i can't see a way to launch the poll so but <laughs> possible I'm you launched to it, I just, it, so 
I can it's see launched. It. Okay, it was not me. <laughs> I'm not gonna own that one. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to hear is, and you can go ahead and um, start filling in the poll as you're probably reading quicker than I'm talking. But we're uh, wanted to think a little bit about what is the top area that you see mm. network supporting providers and access to. Um, so if you could just pick one of those, um, th these particular four areas. We know there's a lot of other areas of support that, that family child care providers, but we're really trying to focus in on this idea of supply and how there's network supports that can support supply. Okay. And so, Danielle, I cannot see results coming in. That's with you. Yes. That rest with you is okay. Best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it just another minute. About half of the attendees have participated. In the meantime, I also wanted to talk about um, educational opportunities. We support CDA and uh, um, quality and any of the um, opportunities for education that educators need. We do surveys on a yearly basis and making sure that we are connected with what the educators need as a whole. And we launch opportunities for educators to kind of as a group come together and work on their skills and and kind of be able to move up on, on different areas of their skill whether it's business or curriculum or environment or the different areas we try to be very responsive to educators in terms of what their skill set is and how to progress on that all right well it looks like voting has slowed i'm going to go ahead and end the poll Yeah, I, yep, I can, we can see the results. And so I, I, everybody obviously can see that the really enrollment supports and then marketing and messaging supports came in a close second to enrollment supports. Um, subsidy rate supports and payment system supports, not quite as much. So subsidy rate still close to the 20% of those of you that kind of picked your, your top one. Um, what I was wondering is if we could take a second and have folks that really felt that enrollment supports are the top area in need or provide that should be provided for family child care. And if anyone would be so brave as to unmute themselves and share sort of their vantage point on that and why they see that as such a critical need of family child care. Now you know that we can't call on you because we don't know who selected that, but that doesn't mean that we can't just call on you. My Hi, um, my name is Gina Puckett. I'm um, from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm the program director for our Child Care Resource and Referral Agency. We have had a program that has worked with our family child care providers locally since 1996, and we've never called it a staff family child care network, but we do many of the same elements. But as far as enrollment supports, um, even for family child care that um, accepts children that have subsidy, what we see a lot of times is that they will enroll a family and then maybe that family loses its job or they move. And so the, um, they lose two or three of the children because uh, often they have the family's children. And so income wise over the course of the year, it, there's a lot of roller coaster to that so that from month to month to month that um, makes it hard for many of them to sustain their business over time. And so trying to like we've done a lot of work with trying to help the market and that kind of thing, but having something that would somehow financially level their income over the course of the year and trying to figure out how to help them better um, be able to get someone in. We, we will refer, continue to refer because we're the local r, &R families, but there, there still are these gaps in their income that make it hard for them over the course of, of the year. Yeah, so sort of not allowing for as much of a, a gap where they have, are kind of seeking and trying to find families to fill slots, especially when they have a whole family leave, like multiple right. children. Um, Rosemary, do you want to speak a little bit to that, that role of enrollment support? I, I think it would be um, interesting to see um, 
because we have a lot of educators that have been for in family childcare for a very long time and we have um quite a few educators that have just started so it'd be great to see to kind of like uh measure that but for the there is instances where there is children that come and go but the flow continues so in 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 this particular um in our particular system kid, kids um and the average enrollment is pretty much steady. So if, if a family child care educator loses one or two children, they fill up. Um, but there is that transition. I agree that there is some point. I think that in what I have seen, I've been in family child care. I've been in the field of early childhood for about 20 years, but I've always had my fingers dipped in, in family child care. And my, one of my first roles was in a different in a different area, but it was family child care as well. I think the hardest part is the first five years when they're trying to kind of get their name out there and establish, you know, um, uh, folks to know about their program and having the stability. But I think, and I would love to hear from other colleagues, but if there's anybody from Massachusetts, but I think that there is some sort of stability that does happen after that. And we do see that some educators um, struggle, but for example, we've had on many instances, we've had, we've done a loan if an educator you know needs a loan and they repay out with time we um talk to them about saving money i mean you know there there are ways to kind of work with them but for the most part there is a flow of yes children transition come and go but for the long term the ones that that do stay they stay for a very long time and they do have um a, a set of, or a source of income that helps them i've also seen that to leverage, sometimes to leverage, um, and I'm being completely honest, um, it's a, it turns into almost like a family thing. The husband is the assistant, the grandchildren um, also are assistants and help out. Like it becomes like the whole household is part of it. And most recently I've seen a lot of um, husband and wife where the, the wife is the family childcare educator and the husband has opened a transportation um, a company where they have one or two vans, maybe even more, and they subsidize, um, they actually subcontract, I should say, sorry, subcontract with us to offer transportation um, for the children. So I've seen like there's, there's many different ways to kind of look at that, but for the most part, um, the educators that, that stay within the field do have consistent income. There's a couple of questions about this idea of supply and more of financial or business supports. And I think that it would, and this may be also where there's other folks that are part of the webinar that may want to jump in with some of their experiences. Um, mm -hmm. But this uh, idea of whether or not one, if you, if as a system you provide any support for licensing fees or insurance costs, and then a couple other folks jumped in speaking about that cost of insurance as being a barrier for family childcare and, and whether or not anyone has used shared service for purchasing insurance. And so Rosemary, if you wanna um, take a couple of those and then we'll see, I know there's some folks on the line that are also actively um, supporting shared service alliances that may wanna jump in with a couple examples. So the way it plays out in Massachusetts, if you want me to start, um, in our particular system, not all systems do this, but our particular system does ask for insurance. Um, and we don't, um, they don't have assistance to pay for insurance. So it's, it's uh, educator's choice, a family child care educator's choice if they want to have insurance, if they want to be part of a different system. In our particular system, they have to have it. What um, the insurance agency does is that they, they spread out the costs of it. Um, and it hasn't been a hindrance in terms of educators have been able to get the insurance because that's one of the requirements when they start with us that they have to get it. Sometimes we give them a little bit of time, a month or two months to kind of figure out, you know, how they can access it and spread out the costs, but they do have to have it to be part of our agency. kind of glancing through to see, I know that we've got a couple of folks that are active with shared service alliances, if you want to jump in on that kind of um, using that vehicle to purchase insurance. Oh, 
don't want to give them time, but I do. There are other costs associated to family child care. Stop me if you, someone has a question, please. But um, the other costs that are associated here in Massachusetts, for example, um, if they have to have their first aid in CPR, they have to pay that out um, on a yearly basis. They have to renew it. And um, in terms of other costs, um, they, if they have to be part of the food program, so they get reimbursed for their food program, but pretty much the consistent cost that they have to do is that. And then there, um, we most recently had the, um, F I always get the letters mixed up, FMLA <laughs> um, here in Massachusetts. We uh, recouped that for the state. We, they have to pay that. It's a small fee. It's not that much, but um, in other states, we do have care uh, union, and if they want to be unionized, they they we also collect that for um, the state to kind of pass it along to um, the union fees. Thanks, Rosemary. I know that there was a question about resources and that was something else that I wanted to highlight as Danielle mentioned at the outset that builds the family child care um, portion of their web pages uh, has been redone and rebuilt with more resources and is going to be launching um, very soon if not if it didn't launch already this week and so we will um, make sure that we direct folks to that as part of the follow-up email that also can it will include some references to shared services approaches and places where they're taking approaches to think about um, sharing costs like insurance across providers so we can share that back out with you all for sure. Um, and then that, that would include like the slide deck and those things is of course in the, the uh, it is recorded also. And then another question that came in was related to zoning. And this is definitely something that in many states and communities has been tackled. I wanna give one example from Southern California where, and very much more of it even at a city level than at the state level, some of the zoning issues that were um, keeping family child care from new entities that were interested in opening up a small or large family child care from being able to, there was, they were running into a lot of issues around zoning and going through the planning department at the city. And so they took from a more systemic approach that what needed to happen was there needed to be more understanding of family child care as a small business in the community and that the planning department needed to have a, a, like a dedicated staff person that really understood family child care and that they would be linked to that individual when they went into the planning department to begin going through some processing of the different paperwork required for the city in order to ensure that it wasn't zoning and the other city ordinances or regulations that were keeping family child cares from being able to open um, especially ones that were interested in, in opening new sites, you know, that maybe existing sites where it had been able to clear those hurdles years ago, but things had changed over recent years. So that is definitely something that we find. And there was a question in the chat. So if other folks have had um, some successes with zoning, that's another example of one of the um, networks in New Mexico that one of the one of their big successes is by really un understanding how re city level regulations were impacting family child care they were able to sort of do the sort of education that would support modifying those regulations to better reflect the type of small business that a family child care is that so sort of the general way that we speak about small businesses doesn't necessarily land the same for a family child care and that that, that can have unintended consequences and what family child cares are facing as they try to stay meet regulations and stay licensed within a city. So if other folks have any other examples of that, we'll also make sure that um, we can point you all to some of those um, specific examples of support for zoning. Rosemary, did you have any um, examples of how systems have supported those the kind of city regulations, zoning regulations, any of those? So um, it hasn't been a major issue of, of zoning here in Massachusetts. What it does encounter is in terms of insurance. I think in some insurance agencies don't want to give insurance to a family child care home. And I think that that um, is with time has gotten better. And we have identified the insurance agencies that do offer family child care um, insurance. I know that recently, um, and it's a little off topic, but recently we were looking at how some insurances are putting into their um, quotes, the, they don't want the liability of COVID. And I know that that's something that has come up where we're looking for and making sure that 
if, if family child care educators have to think about and ask that question, if anything does come up, will the insurance cover it? But zoning hasn't been much of an issue. Um, a lot, they can register their um, family child care home with City Hall and, um, and, and be able, it's a small cost. Of, and in some cities, they, they come do visit actually, or, or there, there's some hurdles to jump through, but it hasn't been an, a large issue. So let's continue the unpacking some of the dimensions of how the family child care system supports family child care. So we're going to move on to then thinking about. Uh, and I'm going to ask if, if you're not speaking to go ahead and mute yourself. TVs and background. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. So we've talked some about um, access for providers and supply all, already. I think what would be um, really nice to move into thinking more about is this flexibility of implementation. I think that uh, there is a lot of examples, and I know that you've all heard uh, Rosemary referencing that in their part of the state, they do one thing and maybe different than another part of the state. And I think this is such an important piece of how we understand and um, think about the idea that a staffed family child care network and the network approach has a set of components to it and parameters or pieces of how the work is done, but there's a lot of room for variance in within what happens and that that is one significant way to be responsive to the provider needs, the community needs, the region, and then it really supports us in, in being more responsive to culture and language diversity of the families and providers in the community. So let's have Rosemary share a little bit about some of that, what that types of variances look like for the Massachusetts system approach. So I think that um, in terms of family child care systems, it depends what part of the state you're in. For example, transportation in Western Mass is something that's a lot larger than in other parts of the state. Um, in terms of supports, for, um, there are large communities in the city, like in Boston, there's really large community of Chinese um, uh, family child care educators. Um, there's, you know, Russian, there's like, um, pockets of family child care educators. So I think that each system has figured out within their region what is the best way to kind of support educators. And that's just one example of culture, language, you know, um, variances in, in, in supports. Some are heavier in some supports and some are heavier in other supports. But I, I think that each, um, for the most part, each system has, has some core fundamental things, but in terms of supports, some have to have offer additional supports and there are some variances. For example, in the eastern part of the state, some of the systems own the transportation. They, the transportation is so large that they have to have the, within their structure the company of transportation so they can maneuver it and, and, um, and have some of the uh, cost be reduced to manage that. So. I think that in, in every region, there's been different variances related to what the needs of the educators are. But I also think that we come together and in, in that um, it, the MADCA is an example of that, how we come together and say, you know, what are the best practices? What are happening? What's happening in this part that we could do better and kind of really talk through things in terms of, and even with the state too, like how can we support you better? Uh, I think that we've gotten to a point um, where we have really close relationships with the State Department and a lot of the licenses are like, hmm, there's an educator, you know, your educator needs this, this and that. And we've gotten to that point where we have a really strong relationship where we can say, okay, we're gonna work on this and we'll work on this together so that we can offer the one-on-one the -on -one, um, supports that the educators need. So it all like the, the regional to expand on that a little is an opportunity where even within the local variations or needs of communities of, and providers, the regional allows you an opportunity to learn from and kind of expand on the best of what others are doing, right? It's not just a matter of, mm -hmm. well, we're so different, there's no way we would learn from another area of the state. It's actually an opportunity to say, how are you dealing with X? Or this is just coming up in our community or our set of providers who's already, um, who has some great strategies for that. What have you found successful? It's a way to sort of be that crowdsourcing of um, strategies to use in your, in your systems, it sounds like. 
Absolutely. And when we talk about regionally, for example, here in Western Mass, um, a lot of family child care systems and individually family child care educators have partnered up with public schools. They're, you know, they're partnered up with um, mental health associations. Like they're in our, our regions, we're able to kind of extend our arms out there and, and really think about what are the some of the services that our um, children and families need. So we're always extending that opportunity. So for example, in, in the Eastern part, you might have a um, family child care system that works very, very closely with a mental health association or with an entity that has early intervention because that's what their families and children need in particular. So I think that there are some variances and almost like natural relationships that happen within that um, to be able to support better the, the family child care educator and the families and children they serve. I think that's a really important um, consideration for different parts of the uh, country to think about too, is that nature of how much it is organically driven by the partners in a community, the needs of the families that are being served by the providers, and that idea of partnering closely with public schools, partnering closely with the EI system, those are all opportunities, and by having that point of entry via the system that providers are plugged into, there's a lot of opportunities for that versus the providers individually having to go and broker all of those community relationships and resource relationships, which is, a, I think, a significant win for both the system as a whole, like the, the network itself that you know, we're talking about, but then the bigger system that the network's part of, right? But I wanted to unpack a little bit more with you, Rosemary, since we don't have any um, um, questions coming into the chat right at this moment, is this idea of responding to um, not just providers uh, of different cultures, but getting more specifically into providers that um, speak a language other than English and sort of the nature of how relationship-based or tailored your supports are in that type of um, relationship when you're engaging with providers. So the the services um, for particularly in our, in our, my system, we have a staff person that speaks Portuguese. We have um, staff members that speak Spanish. We have um, some staff members that speak um, Haitian or Creole, depending on what the needs are. And uh, you know, as much as we can, we offer the supports that are available. And we're always the one raising the hand, like we need the translations we need, and we offer our services as much as we can to help the um, educator understand the processes that they're going through and the regulations that are being asked of them. Um, so we, we provide a lot, we provide um, a staff service, which I think is also really great, is that we will, we will partner with others to kind of get the resources that they need. So if there's a, a local entity that does um, that does translations or if there's a local entity that has ABE classes, if there's, you know, depending on what the, the, the system needs, we will partner with other agencies to provide services that, that they need. But I think that social work approach, I'm going to use that word, of the home visitor and the educator and then thinking about the group needs happens quite often. And we try to meet the cultural language needs as much as we can, because we know that that's what's going to get them to the next level. I've seen also a lot of systems that have partnered, for example, with entities that have English classes or, you know, that are, that are helping them with other types of things. They're kind of associated to run their program. Um, and that's an important piece that also helps us uh, help our educators. Let's pause and um, discuss a little bit with Rosemary and hear from you as well. Um, in particular, the area of supporting family for, uh, child care providers who are um, English language learners or dual language learners um, or dual language um, providers, not learners. I was thinking about children there, obviously, as I was referring <laughs> to it. Um, they, have, they have their home language, even if they're learning English. So I wanted to hear how you found that FCCs have been supported in this area in your state or region. 
And so again, we can go with uh, folks can unmute themselves and share out or ask some questions about it or even share some challenges that you might have experienced in this particular area if you find that it's not as much about support. At registration, we have the questions that we're asking what are on your mind and this this has come up a number of times. So we know it's on your minds. It, here's a great opportunity to, to bring it forward. I'll say something when somebody comes up and has a question. Someone ask a question? I, I was starting to, this is Emily out of North Carolina. Thank you so much. Um, I asked a question about family, friend, and neighbor care because, you know, in North Carolina, it's a felony to care for more than two children full time in your home. And it, it's hard to go past that mindset and um, convince our funders, for one, to allow those of us who, who work for um, state granted supported positions to work with family child care home providers who are in transition from family friend and neighbor care to family child care home. So it's just that's what's on my mind a lot is how can we do it and then in thinking of um, dual language learners we don't even meet them. There's just you know in our uh, CCRNR or other um, supportive partnerships, it's so hard to even meet families and family child care educators who are caring for children in the home and are not licensed. Thank you. Thanks, Do you want me to speak a little bit about Yeah, go that? ahead. Rosie. Yeah, sure. So one thing that I didn't talk about, um, which I think merits a lot of um, value is things weren't the way that they are now. And I think it's really good to have open conversations with your state agencies. We have a great state agency that listens, even if they can't accommodate everything, but they do listen. And, and that relationship has been built with time and with the necessities of children and families. I think that's really important. One thing that um, we have here, and I don't know if other um, states have, we have um, strategies for children, which you might, you, you can look into their website. And all they do is advocacy for early childhood, you know, and bring up, they have relationships with legislators, they have relationships with advocates, other advocates in the field that kind of bring these concerns up and help us in the field, you know, systems and educators kind of have that voice and that being able to come forward with the issues and unite together to kind of talk about that. And the other piece that I didn't bring up, it almost happens organically because I'm part of one system, another educator might be a part of another system, but organically they uh, put together peer support groups and the, the state, the, the professional development folks and our and the systems have acknowledged how important that is to they themselves come together and have their voice and 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 talk peer to peer you know these are the things that i'm seeing how can we support each other how can we we offer that space as a system but i think it's also really good for I have one educator that always says, well, I went to the peer support group and I said, Clarendon does this and we do that. And we do. So it's kind of like a, a, another way and another level because we had to think of different levels, not just going up and down, but going side to side and, you know, like in reverse and all kinds of ways to kind of get the message out there. But I would encourage educators to to think about you know these peer support groups have some merit especially if if they're willing to be that voice to kind of share out information and looking for different avenues of sharing information for us it's been a, a really good relationship with our state agencies and with our advocates to kind of triangle this um voice of you hear it on this side you hear it on that side and what can you do on the legislative side, what can you do as a state agency? Like we, we know what our barriers and where we can be at, but we could also come together and say, well, within our role, this is what we could do. You know, within your role, what can you do and kind of partner together? 
Right. I think that peer-to-peer -peer element and that may be a way for providers to initially feel comfortable engaging in the system of supports and then engaging in communicating as an advocate, communicating with the state, right? It adds some um, trust and familiarity. I want to acknowledge the um, variety of questions that we've received on family, friend, and neighbor care in the chat and really um, a highlight and note that we appreciate that. That is an area as we think about this topic, and as we said at the outset, right, we have this kind of big bucket of home-based child care and what, what goes into that license exempt, licensed family child care, um, family friend and neighbor, some communities or states refer to it as, um, you know, in kith and kin care. And we do have a lot of good resources and models out there for engaging with that population, particularly to some of Emily's point about sort of sites that are um, Kind of flying under the radar or maybe feeling like how would you work with them because if they're technically um, they're they're doing something that's unregulated or they're working against outside of regulations how do you engage with them so what we'd like to um, put forward is that we will build that into one of our subsequent calls we have this that's the beauty of this being a discussion so we really appreciate you raising the questions we appreciate uh, the folks that are kind of stepping into the chat and sharing some of what what you've done or how your model's working on it and so this is the opportunity that we can we can build a discussion much like we've had this robust discussion with rosemary about the massachusetts approach we can do that and really focus on the idea of family friend and neighbor care as an un, unlicensed setting that are, and not um, license exempt, but the uh, those other providers. And we know that there are some great examples of that there's a portion of those providers that may be a pipeline into the licensed family child cares and how do you work with those and, and what, what are, have been successful strategies. So watch for that. That'll be sometime in the next um, few weeks. We do want to talk to you a little bit about the schedule, as Danielle said, when we look at the last slide. But before we do that, I do want to um, have one more point of contact here with Rosemary where, and Rosemary, it's a great segue where you started talking about the role of the state and how you work with the state, but I want to kind of just push you to share with us um, one of your, uh, sort of your most important areas or elements of support that the state has either built or how they continue to support the systems in Massachusetts that makes them successful, maybe one or two things, kind of the top thing as you relate it. Before I go to answer that, I did want to say something to to the point of the kin um, and because remember in our state we have 30 percent of the educators that are, are part of systems and the others are not part of uh, systems and i know within the last year the state agency our state agency has asked ccr and ours to have a department within because they have regional offices and to have a department that's going to look closer into the relationship with those educators um, and see how they can work with those educators a little bit closer. So I, it might be a great idea to kind of dig into that because that's going to that's gonna prove to help a lot of educators, um, whether they join a system or they're part of the CCRNR or whatever, to kind of receive more, more um, resources available to them. So in terms of your question of the delivering the relationship or kind of, you know, coming together, um, the, the elements that I feel like um, are really good in general, and I think I, I, point, I alluded to that earlier, is that we see ourselves, the family child care system, as we have to do the hand-holding with the educator of helping and having that one-on-one -on -one relationship, but also we look at the broader picture and how, what resources, we, we think about this all the time, what are the resources that are available that we can access and we can partner and work together to kind of bring to that educator so whether it's curriculum questions you know whether it's it's uh, quality questions whether whatever area they need we try to meet those needs as much as we can and if we as a system can't meet it we all will always refer them to wherever they can find those so we kind of are that um starting point that one-on-one -on -one to um have that honest conversation with and see where the educator needs the support and we try to build relationships outwards so we could have that we can be part of that bigger conversation rosemary i'm going to press you with one last question because i don't want to, to not answer the question that cami raised uh, around whether you encourage your providers to become NAFCC accredited. And we do know that that is an approach that's used in a lot of states, but I wanted to hear um, Massachusetts' approach to that. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, um, I've been around for 20 plus years and 
20 years ago, the conversation was huge on NFACC. And we encourage our educators to do it and we want them to continue to do it. Um, the conversation has in Massachusetts flattened a little bit because of the QRIS and because of all the other elements. But I think that for in our, in our work, in all of our work, it's the one that speaks directly to family child care and it's it's where um where it needs to be but i think that um there are so many things that happen at once so you have um the interest where does the the best interest lies but we always communicate to educators you should be part of the nfacc as well and we support them if they choose that route because remember it's the educator's choice And then we do um, have, and this is something that we were actually going to um, in a, a, a discussion a couple of weeks from now, maybe um, further into the summer, wanted to share out some other examples of really aligning with QRIS systems within states and really focusing on quality. And um, Alabama is a great example of an approach to statewide um, family child care supports that is built upon the idea of accreditation and moving programs through NAFCC. So we wanted to pull in another one of our state partners um, in that instance too. So we will, we, we put a pin in that to continue that discussion as well around NAFCC. So thanks for the question. And Rosemary's information will be shared. It's actually in the slide deck, so you'll yes. have it. And then as well. a, yeah. <laughs> Perfect segue. Um, Gina, can you share the, the last slide? Sure. Awesome. Well, we just want to take a moment and thank everyone for joining us today in another fantastic conversation. I wanted to make mention, I'm going to put it in the chat box right now, that we have, we're reorganized and relaunching the BUILD Initiatives home-based child care resources page. So you'll see many tabs, many of the things that we've discussed today, including state examples, community examples, COVID supports, um, business supports, some FFN supports as well, and, and some materials that are, that are out there. Um, we are really excited to invite you all back next week at 2 p.m. Eastern for discussion around delivering relationship-based supports. And then we'll continue the series June 30th and July 7th at the same time. Additionally, want to let you know that because of COVID, the annual Build QRIS conference has been moved online and it is available to everyone. Um, the sessions, the announcement just went out this afternoon. Gina and I will take a look at the sessions that may be of, a, of especially of interest for home-based childcare providers and systems and post those as well in an email to you. There is limited registration numbers for the sessions. So, um, go ahead and take a look at that and, and sign up as soon as you can. Thank you again. We will be posting this on the website, the recording, as well as the PowerPoint. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll leave the chat box in thank up you, for Rosemary. a minute and we'll close thank out. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.